Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We want to make this session as interactive as possible, so I'd like to go over a few technical items with you before we begin. First of all, if you need any technical assistance, please type your questions into the questions box on the right-hand side of the console and click the Submit button. You can adjust the size and position of the windows featured in today's event console, and the presentation may include elements that could open a new window on your computer, so please be sure to disable any pop-up blockers that you may have installed. We encourage your questions at any time during today's event. Again, to submit your questions, enter them into the questions box on the right-hand side of the screen and click the Submit button. We'll attempt to answer as many questions as possible during our question and answer session later in today's event. We'd also like to inform the audience that you'll receive an email in the coming days with a link to the replay of this webinar, as well as a PDF copy of today's presentation. I'd now like to turn things over to today's moderator, Rich Peasy, Editorial Director for HIMSS Media. Thanks very much. I'd also like to welcome everyone to today's HIMSS and Healthcare IT News webinar, Hospital System and EMS Collaboration. Driving Population Health Management Through Community Paramedic Programs, sponsored by Philips. The Affordable Care Act has changed the way hospitals and EMS agencies will be reimbursed. Management of the chronically ill in a community is a critical part of managing cost. An emerging trend is EMS agencies and hospitals working together to connect care with information that matters. During this webinar, you'll learn how the community paramedic fits in within the context of the Affordable Care Act and how existing resources within the EMS agency might be allocated now to help start a community paramedic program. Our speaker today will be David Glendening, EMS Education Coordinator at New Hanover Regional Medical Center. David has been a paramedic for 20 years. He is a paramedic instructor at Cape Fear Community College, Level 1 Paramedic Instructor in North Carolina, an Advanced Stroke Life Support Instructor associated with the University of Miami, and an Advanced Cardiac Life Support Instructor, AHA. And now, I'd like to hand it off to David to begin our presentation. Thanks, Rich. Hello to everybody out there um, logging in. I see we currently have uh, 128 of you from uh, across the country. I was able to take a look at uh, the uh, backgrounds of um, the majority of the folks who signed in today. And uh, I see a very well-rounded group uh, from CEOs of hospitals to EMS uh, coordinators um, to hospital administrators to uh, data, uh, data management. And uh, it really looks like we've got a great group out there today that really are curious or looking at the, their existing programs like um, we've been doing over the last couple of years and, and seeing how we can make things better and how in the heck we can manage um, the Affordable Health Care Act to actually work because it is law and it is here and, and you know we've got to deal with it. Um, I want to open up today um, with this, this first slide here. This is uh, what I like to say a beautiful picture of our, our downtown area of Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm going to go over a uh, little bit of demographics and some information about the area we're in here. Um, we are in North Carolina, and uh, we are on the coast. Um, we are about the fourth smallest county fourth or fifth smallest county in uh, North Carolina. And uh, I just want to give you an idea of the population uh, punch that we do have down here. Now, North Carolina as a whole has a square mile population of about 1,029 folks per square mile. Down here in uh, our county where we sit, we have an average um, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It's actually 129 per square mile in North Carolina. And down here, our square mile average, we have 1,029 people. So we have about 200,000 people in our county. And uh, when the tourists come down, because we are an ocean community in the summertime, that number can spike up to as high as 250,000. So we can have some uh, folks from up north and all around the country uh, helping us to exceed uh, up to 50,000 on top of that 200,000 in our community. So we get pretty tight. Um, we have um, both what I like to call a rural and a metro area um, for the EMS folks on the line. There are areas where transfer time, um, transportation time can take about 30 minutes um, to get to our hospital, uh, New Hanover Regional Medical center um, and then sometimes we take just five minutes um, we have um, we have our million dollar homes and we have our um, um, our, our middle class and then we do have our um, uh, under middle class populations as well. Our EMS service as a whole um, last year we uh, responded to total responses and this would include uh, calls for help as far as standby um, and what that means is the uh, ambulance will have to adjust and, and move around the county to provide coverage when uh, other ambulances are out. The total calls for everything including transports is 52,212. 
Now, when you break that down to um, responses where are not um, standby coverage, yet number is 31,044 for last year, and our actual transports is 21,792. We have at our hot time, which is pretty much about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we have 12 available transport units um, out serving the community, along with two quick response vehicles, which are two uh, basically pickup trucks with paramedics in them and uh, care measures that can start the care until a transport unit gets there. And then we have an operations supervisor who is also a full functioning paramedic. We are a hospital-based EMS uh, system which uh, means the hospital does provide all the EMS here in uh, the community. We have an excellent working relationship with our fire departments and all of those fire departments um, they are pretty much 99.9% .9 of them are all at least emergency medical technician basics and there's about 600 of them. So about 109 paramedics, 600 EMTs, a total of 709 EMTs here in our county. So in 2013, in the beginning of 2013, you know, and uh, I know a lot of people can relate to this. This is no secret, even if you're not in EMS. You know, 911 volume has been increasing over the years. Um, we are continually having to look at having to add ambulances because everything is about response times and being able to have that ambulance there for um, for our citizens when they need it. Uh, we are also an integrated system, meaning you see that helicopter there that is also part of our. Um, um, emergency transportation services, which also does fall under the hospital. We do provide the critical care in our region, which includes uh, seven counties, and we are a cardiac tertiary center, center for those seven counties. Um, <clears throat> today we'll be spe uh, specifically speaking uh, to the EMS division. So rather than continually adding ambulances, we started to look at the possibility of how, how can we start uh, combating against the calls because on average, uh, the majority of these calls aren't true emergencies, uh, such with the uh, emergency room starting to get bogged down with you know, what would be related to is not truly what an emergent crisis would be. The reality was is that 911 is becoming a safety net for all non-emergent health care. And as you can see on the slide here, these, uh, these data points carry a lot of punch, especially to system administrators and folks who have to pay the bills on um, these ambulances. 29% of our 911 requests were actually non-emergent, and uh, they would be classified as what is an alpha or omega response. Now, real quick, the way that works is an alpha or omega response after it goes through a CAD system on the dispatch center is determined that it would not be a lights and sirens uh, request. So the ambulance unit would not uh, run what we call emergency traffic to the house. And an example of this would be something like a 17-year-old who has uh, a productive cough, who is, is, and that would pretty much be his only complaint. And that would probably generate an alpha or omega response. When you start seeing the uh, Bravo, Charlie, and the Delta responses, that's where the computer has generated a higher response, you know, such as a 52-year-old real male who's complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath. That would, that would bring the lights and sirens response. But 29% of these 911 requests are, are pretty much not lights and sirens. And we also discovered that our top 10 users of our 911 system accounted for 702 of our EMS responses in 2012. And that's, that's a big punch. And if you can find a way to uh, get these people to the health care that they actually need, um, Maybe they don't need to go to the emergency room. Maybe we just need to find a way to be able to network them off to their primary care physician or other services available in the county. And then surprise, surprise, ED turnaround times were increasing. These patients are not only coming in in the wrong area necessarily, but um, trying to get them the services they need while they're sitting in the bed and they're taking up hours worth of ER space. And uh, as you can imagine, that's an increasing burden on the United States, not just here in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So the question that we had to put you know, is are we providing the right level of services and are we delivering these patients to the most appropriate facilities? Now, you'll find that across the country there are some some rules and regulations in place that will not allow an ambulance to just transport somebody to um, a behavior health services facility or to the primary care position. The way EMTALA laws are written and COBRA and um, Medicare and Medicaid rules, they pretty much state that we have got to transport them to a designated emergency room. There's really been no way around this. One of the positive things out of the Affordable Care Act is it's really forcing us to look at that and seek other venues and uh, change some legislature and change some rules that are in place that will allow us to possibly do this in the future.
So, yeah, again, in 2013, as we're looking at all this, we have this this huge, huge tidal wave of what we know is coming our way, which is health care reform. We know the Affordable Care Act has been signed into law and that it's coming our way. And rather than, you know, try and just turn this ship around, we have to, you know, I love this picture here, we just have to take this wave on, and not just us, but other agencies across the country. And, um, you know, hospitals, and EMS, and we're all, we're all pretty much in this together saying, hey, we've got to get this done. We've got to come up with solutions to these problems, or um, we're going to start getting penalized with fees. Uh, we're going to start not being able to access health care as a, as a whole for ourselves. So we've got to figure out a way to get this done. So with that said, we've got a uh, poll question up here. Hopefully all 141 of you will participate here. True or false? Due to higher advances in healthcare in the United States, people are living longer versus social medicine type areas around the world. If you guys can go ahead and uh, click on whether or not you feel that's true or false. Okay, I'm sure the majority of you out there have answered. It looks pretty close there. 57% of you say true, and 43% uh, of you say false. So let's, uh, you know, with every question, I've got some support and some data behind me as far as the answers go. And we'll take a look at this slide right here. Some of you may or may not have seen this. Well, the answer is no. No, the United States is not any better in healthcare when it comes to mortality rates um, and people living longer. If you look over to the left there, this slide represents a rising increase in life expectancy. And look where the United States is sitting. So for years, I think we've sat on our throne of saying, you know, we have the best medicine available and, uh, you know, don't ever take away our right to choose where we're going to go because we, we want to go to wonderful facilities that um, offer these opportunities for these advanced disease processes. But in the end, you know, if everybody doesn't have access to that, then you're probably going to wind up with numbers like this. So right now, even though we're spending more and we do have some more opportunities as far as advanced health care, it's not helping us when it comes to mortality. So this is not something that, that we can ignore anymore. Thanks for participating in that poll question. So I'm sure uh, a lot of you folks have heard about this health care reform and the, uh, the triple aim initiative. You know, these are three points right here that we really feel that we've kind of been applying in uh, a lot of uh, our, definitely in our EMS agency. A lot of EMS agencies across the country probably have already been doing this out in the field. We've always been try, you know, tried to improve the patient experience. Well, now the government would like you to do that, and the Affordable Health Care Act would like you to do that, too including the quality and satisfaction of how things go. And if you think about it, if your patient is happier and they're more satisfied, that's half the battle as far as health care goes. And we want to improve the health of populations. You think about the slide we just showed up there. Sure we do. We want our, we want our folks to live longer, too. And we want to reduce the per capita cost of health care. Yep, everybody wants to find a more efficient way to do this. Of course, we've got this battle that we're always going to have is we need more money to be able to provide better solutions. And then on the other end is well, you need to learn how to run it better. And if anybody's familiar with a company called Toyota and their lean processes, you know, I know our hospital has pretty much taken on the lean mission. You know, every department has been charged with coming up with something that works better, more efficient. I, I think there are some things out there that we can do better. And specifically, I think the community paramedic can help out with this. So as we're moving along, this, as an EMS agency, as a pre-hospital provider, we're, we're looking at this going, we, we have an, a unique opportunity here. Uh, we have a, a unique opportunity to fill unmet needs with untapped resources. And how can the community paramedic fill these gaps? Well, we can use our existing scope of practice and not expand our roles any further than what North Carolina Office of EMS has granted us to do. Uh, we can assess and identify gaps between community needs and services, and we can improve the quality life 
of life and health overall. So the key thing there in the middle with uh, assess and identify gaps between community needs and services, there's not going to be a paramedic out there that doesn't have a few years of experience or, you know, a basic EMT that hasn't been in a home where they recognize that there's a need here, that they don't necessarily need to go to the emergency room, that they probably need a behavioral consult or maybe a consult with the family. You know, we've been on the phone before speaking with family members saying, hey, you know, this, I, I really feel that your mom or dad here could benefit from, uh, you know, a link to this service. And then, you know, we leave phone numbers behind. We, we're pretty good at uh, navigating already, you know, and we're not even fine-tuned on how to do it even better. So we know what our community needs are. We know we need to reduce unnecessary 911 utilization and our ED visits for our familiar faces and our familiar places. I'm going to pause on that. Everybody's, you know, a lot of people in the, on, the, on the computers right now are going, raising their eyebrows, going, well, doesn't he mean, uh, you know, frequent flyers and frequent places? And this is something that we've learned from our experts in behavior medicine, that we should not term it familiar faces or familiar, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, frequent flyers anymore because that's a negative approach. And if you think about it, it's, it's hard to, to change your tune, but after you change your tune and you start calling it familiar faces and familiar places, you know, I, I did have the threat of lightning bolts coming down from the heavens from my behavior friends if, uh, if I did not say it correctly in meetings. But it becomes comfortable and it works a little better for you. Um, familiar faces and familiar places, how do we get these people to stop calling when they don't need, um, you know, 911? one services. Well, you get them the services they need before they go to reach for that phone. So how are you going to do We obviously can't do that in a regular 911 unit, you know, because it's not designed to just run around and check on everybody. Well, we need somebody that's going to be moving around and checking on these folks and catching them before the moment when they have to hit 911 on the telephone. That's proactively managing their care. And you serve as a trained navigator of community resources. And uh, in parentheses, there is a code outreach. And that's a, that's a committee that was formed inside of our hospital by our trauma coordinator. Um, she brought the emergency room leadership and some folks from behavioral services and some other key players to the table. And they started reviewing the frequent flyers that they had. Oops, I just said it right there, the familiar faces that they had uh, coming into the emergency room. And you know, we found out that a lot of our same uh, familiar users of 911 match those folks. So we sat on this committee for a couple of meetings, and we were uh, we were able to extract a lot of great data, and we we're also able to share them our vision of creating this community paramedic and what their role we thought would be in just this code outreach group. And as you can imagine, we were welcomed with open arms. Um, we want to improve our readmission rates. Obviously, the 30-day readmission is you know one of the biggest hot topics, especially for hospital administrators out there in the in the country. We want to keep our patients out of the hospital and do them better at home after we've treated them initially for the initial complaint. You know, how can we, as community paramedics, help with this? How can we care for these high-risk patients? Well, we can probably head out into the community and check on them again before they're reaching that point to where they have to call 911. Even if they have home health care set up, you know, there's days where home health care and even uh, home health care aides are not going to be able to make it out there because they're, over or they're overburdened right now. This is where we help fill the gaps and help support those roles. Um, this is, and that brings me into the next line there, partnering in health care systems, and you integrate your care coordination. You have to work in cooperation with other stakeholders and medical providers, which means everybody. So as we are brewing this together, we are thinking that we might have quite the tool for the Affordable Health Care Act out there specifically. And uh, we, we've got the, uh, the availability to do it in our existing paramedics right now. Um, with maybe some, some increased training and some increased awareness and fine-tuning them and getting them a vehicle and uh, having the tools that they need to include everything that would be in one of our quick response vehicles um, with some other extra added stuff. So how are we going to get the funding for this? Well, we're thinking this is a great program everybody wants. Your help, wants you to come in and you're going to do so much, but of course, you know, doing great things is not funded on hopes and dreams. Um, eventually, somebody has to pay for it. So we uh, did a fantastic job. Um, um, my director in chief, uh, Rick O'Donnell, spent uh, lots of hours inside the hospital working with the hospital administration, including the CEO and, uh, and the vice president leadership teams, on on showing them where we can make positive impact out in the community. And our CEOs very, very big on impact out in the community um, and managing health care out 
in the community before, you know, before we come into our hospital. So they were pretty much sold on this, and we were working on ways to try and find creative funding from inside the hospital. Um, and in the meantime, we, of course, were going to look at some grant opportunities. So our government officer, um, who specializes in grant writing, had been in on a couple of the committee meetings with us, and he said this is absolutely an opportunity that we could have to write for, uh, write for grants. So we did reach out to the, up in the right corner there, you'll see the Duke Endowment, um, J.B. Duke. We did reach out to Duke Endowment, and we did uh, prepare a grant application, um, which was tedious, and I can promise you it was well worth it in the end because we were lucky enough um, to be awarded a grant from Duke to get this program up and running. And what we asked for was um, funding for uh, two full-time community paramedics and one half-time community paramedic. And when I say half-time, I, uh, I mean uh, it'll be a rotation through EMS half of the time through the month, and then the other half it will be dedicated to the community paramedic role. Um, in this grant, we also included the training and um, the, uh, the salaries for them for the for the next two years, and the grant does not provide any funding. I just want to make you guys out there where the grant will not provide any funding for uh, materials and equipment. The, uh, we actually in-kinded that through the support of New Hanover Regional Medical Center to come up with the funding on that. So we are very, very thankful to them, and uh, this grant will be, we're almost in the first year of the grant, and we'll be heading into the second year here soon. Now, our obligations on that grant, the three main things that we want to show is that we are affecting the 30-day readmission rate. We are affecting our familiar places. We're showing a measured decrease in the amount of 911 calls coming out of there. And of course, we are affecting a positive impact on our frequent users of the emergency room, as well as the, you know, the top 10 or so that are, are using 911 calls, um, showing that we can definitely make a difference. Those are our three initial obligations. And then, of course, as you can imagine, we have about 10 more personally that we're adding on to that. Um, these are also some examples of folks who are interested as far as funding and paying. Um, Coastal Care, that's one of our behavioral services folks that, who we're partnering in with. Um, there is definitely an interest in visiting homes of behavior based patients who uh, this population could possibly be navigated to different areas uh, rather than an emergency room to include um, a behavior hospital uh, type direct admission. Um, versus having to be transported in an ambulance to the emergency room. I just want to make reference to the work that uh, Wake County EMS has done. They are working on a very, very, very uh, important uh, behavior-based program up there where they're looking at um, alternative destinations and getting it cleared so that these behavior patients will be able to go right from wherever their advanced practice paramedic is located with them to get them um, uh, headed off to the right direction and not heading to the emergency room and not taking up one of their uh, one of their ambulances. That's something similar what we're looking uh, to do down here with our coastal care partners. And as far as uh, obtaining a possible small amount of reimbursement for for that type of service, Elder House that is a um, a group that is dedicated to that's a national group. We have a PACE program here. Um, they're dedicated to keeping the senior population um, high quality of life and out of the hospital. Um, through, uh, through their senior services they have on site, through their staff going out and uh, visiting. You know, the main mission with a PACE program um, patient is that you don't go to the hospital unless it's absolutely, absolutely necessary. And uh, they're definitely interested in working with us. Um, hospice is the Lower Cape Fear, and I'll speak a little bit more to them uh, later on in the presentation. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina is, is very interested in this community paramedic uh, type role. And uh, of course, Medicare and Medicaid in our state, thanks to our state leadership and coming together with uh, other EMS agencies in our state who have um, community paramedic type programs up and running. Um, they are listening to us and saying, yes, this is a possibility that uh, we can hopefully get you reimbursed for community paramedic type visits in the house. And of course, the US Department of Veterans Affairs, everybody knows how easy it is to climb that mountain. And I'll speak a little bit more to the VA here a little bit later in the presentation. Another question for you guys out there, just want to make sure that you're awake and uh, listening. So go ahead and grab one of these answers. Paramedics on average receive about X amount of hours of curriculum training before obtaining their initial certification. Bam, look at that. So this is great. This is fantastic. So we're around 71% right out of the gate. You think 1,100 didactic and clinical hours. That's a lot. 
And then some of you are thinking around 700, which might be a little more realistic. I know I'm not supposed to give hints to what the possible answer is, but don't trust me. I'm just the presenter. Five hundred didactic and clinical, fourteen percent. All right, I think most of you out there have gotten gotten time to grab this one. So those of you who chose eleven hundred didactic and clinical hours, you are correct. I wish it was seven hundred when I went to paramedic school. I probably would have had a little bit more time and uh, life. But yeah, it's a, it equals 1,100 didactic and clinical hours. Now this will range a little bit from state to state, but pretty much most of the programs out there that follow the national curriculum, this is it. You're around 1,100 didactic and clinical, and here's the kicker. It's over about 10 months. So if you were to equate that into how much college credit you would get, about two years. Two years of semester credit is what it about equals out to. And this really gets broken down to, uh, you know, cardiovascular, pulmonary measure, uh, pulmonary medications, um, how to manage scenes, it, it does really get intense at moments and it's the clinical time that you share uh, with emergency room staffs, uh, burn units, OBGYNs, you know, we become pretty well-rounded as, uh, as we all say, you know, a master of uh, a little bit of everything. Um, and if you can imagine uh, the amount of, uh, the amount of I've got a good idea as far as every single aspect of medicine out there, it, it, it's, it's up there. We get just a good taste, just the right amount of taste of everything. So let's just give you an idea of the initial uh, training levels that paramedics have out there. The public really doesn't understand that. They still think of us as Johnny and Roy, and uh, God bless them. They definitely helped us get here, but uh, we do far much more now than just put them in the ambulance and drive them off to the hospital. So thanks for participating into that. So with this grant, we now know that we have the money and the funding. So how did we pick these three paramedics? How did we come down to it? Well, we composed a three-part interview process. And you'll notice that we have multidisciplinary evaluators on there. We just took all this time to build all these bridges into all these disciplines of medicine that will probably be involved in, um, in these community paramedic type patients that we would see. Well, why not have them come in and help us pick out who would be the best? We're good at picking who are good employees are going to be out of here, but if, if you are sitting there thinking, well, it's going to be the 20-year paramedic who is going to be the best, you were wrong. You're absolutely wrong. It's a, it can be a five-year paramedic. It can be a 10-year paramedic. It's primarily got to be somebody with a big heart who is pretty clinically sharp. Um, so we had a pen, panel interview process. Um, we had all the candidates. There were, I think, initially 12 applied out of the 109, and then seven actually interviewed. Um, they had to do a presentation on what they felt community paramedic uh, would look like here in New Hanover County. Um, they had to do a written clinical exam, which consisted of about 50 general um, topic questions in relation to behavior medicine, uh, geriatric medicine, and the uh, some readmission type questions. And then we had them do an inbox exercise, which was designated uh, basically to see if they could organize things, to, including a, like a medication reconciliation type uh, environment and manage a, manage a room as far as a patient goes around it and, and bring things collectively together so that they would not end up going back to the hospital or call 911. The three providers that we were select, uh, that we did select and offer positions to, and they did all three uh, except for Matt, Sarah, and Michael. And on average, we, it turned up to be about 21 years of EMS experience. And on average, uh, they all had about 15 years experience as paramedics. Two of them were our field training officers, and um, one of them was a special operations paramedic. So as you can see, they were pretty much you know, in the top 5 and the top 10% of the of the crop, so to say, here in our ranks. Um, but the key thing is they also had great personalities and big hearts, and they were the ones that were going to be on scene that were making the diabetic the full meal and um, making sure that they had a full belly after we, you know, we fixed their blood sugar and making sure that they have the neighbor that's going to come over and check on them in an hour. Um, 
you know, cleaning up the floor if, uh, you know, an elderly patient ended up cutting themselves and they got blood on the carpet because they're worried that the senior, that their patient is not, is going to bend over and try and clean it themselves because they have such a high sense of pride and they want a spotless home and, and they're so embarrassed that we're going to be in there. These guys were the ones that would stay, in, stay on that call just a little bit longer and make sure that everything was covered. So these are the types of paramedics that, you, that we felt would do best in our program. Our program consisted of a journey over a year and a half. Now, this is um, a team of folks um, led by myself basically combed the country and said, what is working? Well, we've got some wonderful programs out there. Minnesota um, has been doing community paramedic for, for quite some time. Texas has been doing community paramedic. Um, Colorado, you know, every, you know, there's so many different um, programs that have been up and running for for several years that have been doing great things so we looked we looked and we we said well how are we going to make our community paramedics you know fine tuned so that they can have the crucial conversations that they need to have with every healthcare provider out there and we kept coming back to Minnesota and uh, the Minnesota community paramedics and their training and uh, you know we looked at this and we looked at 308 hours of didactic and clinical training um, and we thought, well, that seems like a bit much. But after we broke it through the program and had some conversations with them and saw how they were involved in, um, there's actually been a, a Nash or a worldwide consortium of uh, community paramedic conversations that have take, been taking place. There is a uh, world organization um, under WHO, and for the last seven or eight years, they've been getting together and talking about community paramedicine. And the Minnesota folks have been on this board. And we looked at the training and we thought this is fantastic, especially the 196 hours of clinical training that you see on the bottom, because guess where they get to do this? They get to do this in our backyard. So that, again, they're helping to establish the relationships that they need to have with the very same people that they're working with. Um, they have all since completed their classroom portion and they're hopefully wrapping up their clinical time here within, within this week. Um, and it's been fantastic. It's been a fantastic journey working with uh, the folks in Minnesota and working with, of course, the clinical sites that we have here. So program keys, so we're building this uh, the entire time. This has been going on over this last yeah, last year. As you can imagine, we've, this is brand new off the ground. We've had to develop our program guidelines to build a community paramedic documentation module within EPIC. And yes, New Hanover Regional Medical Center is an EPIC hospital. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with EPIC, it's an electronic medical record. And this is where we, you know, we pause and we talk about well, data. You know, data is one of the biggest things that's going to move the success of any program. We've heard that from all the existing programs out there. Here in North Carolina, with all the up and coming programs that we have here now, every time we get together and talk about this, we understand how important this is. Um, we have to be able to measure something and show more quality of life, happier patients, people not going back into the hospital so that we can get people to fund this program. So how do, how do we talk? Talk. You know, how do our community paramedics talk with EPIC? Well, through some uh, leadership nationally and with our local EPIC uh, representative that handles our home health care agency, we are currently working on building modules uh, with a target date of June. And we're hoping to get that moved up so that our community paramedics will have laptops, will be able to log in on EPIC and be able to chart freely and uh, have all this stuff tied in with uh, documentation inside the hospital. The primary care physicians will be able to see what exactly is going on with their patients when we do our, our visits. Um, we hold weekly quality assurance meetings with uh, the community paramedic interns as well as the director of EMS and uh, a couple other key players. We ensure that we're, we're going to deliver quality and cost-effective care. Now, we do and have had actually some beta patients, and I'll show you some information here in a few minutes, um, that we have been seeing. So they're not actually registered and put into the program, for to say, but we need, we need some folks that we can, uh, that we can uh, see what's working best and actually be able to show some positive impact. And boy, even though it's a small population, you'll see we've already had uh, some major positive impact with our few patients. And we want to measure client satisfaction. So of course, we have satisfaction tools that we use. Um, and we want to cult continue to cultivate our partnerships with our other community stakeholders. And here is some of our early results. Like I said, you know, I, I'm going to emphasize this is not thousands of patients here. 
you know, we are in a beta beta type mode right now, and uh, as of February, we'll be off running and taking a full patient population. But as you can see, we're looking at some key things there, and it basically comes down to satisfaction. Um, you can see overall, pretty high. They're pretty happy with the community paramedic. Um, I like the quote down there um, is saying that um, she's just having a bad day and um, is glad that uh, I came by to see him. Now, I'll, I'll speak specifically to this one because at the, the end of my job duties, I have other duties as assigned, and I was probably one of the first community paramedic interns to go ahead and go out and start seeing beta patients. That quote is specifically from a congestive heart failure patient that I was working with, and it was a one visit where I just popped in to see him to see how he was doing, and everything was good. The vitals checked out good, and uh, I looked up at him, and I said, uh, are you feeling okay? And he said, I'm just actually having a bad day. And uh, he's, he's happy that I was there. Now, whether or not I saved him from calling 911, I don't know. But I sure helped, helped him feel better for the minute. And, uh, you know, I saw him the next uh, two days later, and he said again, he said, I really needed somebody just to come in and say hello to me. And what all the difference in the world it made just coming by and visiting him. So that's, that's about quality of patient satisfaction and helping them with quality of life. <clears throat> EMS transports pre and post community paramedicine program for our beta. As you can see, um, we have a couple of patients put in here pre. They all took some uh, significant amount of journeys, about 23 transports to the hospital. And since we've been involved with them, we brought them down to about three. And I can tell you the times that they did have to go, one of the cases was uh, they were anemic. Um, obviously, there's not much that we can do out in the field to prevent that. And uh, another one was for, a, uh, I think, a suicide or psychiatric admission. So not too bad. And here, um, inpatient stays into the program, and I love this quote right here. I know how big those bars look, and those are most impressive, but that quote there is what's most impressive. This particular beta patient that we have, they helped me when my asthma was getting bad, and I stayed out of the hospital. So let me tell you the story behind this one. So our, our community paramedic interns went out and did an evaluation, and they determined that this patient wasn't doing so well. And they know the history. This is about the fourth or fifth visit. They know the complete history, and they've determined that this patient is pretty much on the border right now of having to go to the emergency room. Well, operating off of our existing um, protocols and platforms, you know, they called into the emergency room and let them know that they're going to call the primary care physician and that uh, the patient does not want to go to the emergency room and that they were going to get a refusal and uh, the emergency room online medical control doctor was completely okay with that. Um, also, here is the, uh, the other wonderful thing we were able to do. We were able to give a, an initial dose of um, steroids there in the house. They were able to give 125 milligrams of solumedrol and um, which is something that uh, that paramedics can normally do out in the field here in North Carolina. And they were able to arrange transport for her to get up to see the primary care physician within the next hour. Uh, she was discharged back home with a, with a package of um, – uh, extended um, steroids to continue the steroids out for the next two weeks, and, and guess who never had to go to the hospital? It was fantastic. So that was a big success right there, and she was very happy with the fact that she didn't have to go and get admitted to the hospital, which normally, when you look into her history, that probably would have been a one- to two-day stay, because she probably would have called the next day after um, it was already past the point of a community paramedic or other health care provider being able to keep her out of the hospital. Here's the money for our folks on the hospital who are or on the line who are, um, you know, hospital administrators thinking, well, can this, you know, save me money uh, overall in the long run? Well, sure. You know, and again, this is early preliminary results, just a few patients. But as you can see, the pre-investment um, into the health care bill was about almost a half million dollars, and we get it down to 118000 So if we're able to do this with a few patients, we sure should be able to do this with a large patient population. And you can just imagine how good those numbers will probably look after that. So our lessons learned specifically from the community paramedic interns who have been working through this as far as the training goes, they, they learned that community paramedic students, you know, as they, as they are right now, they don't know as much as they thought they did. Now remember, these are 15-year on average paramedics, 20 years involved in EMS. And specifically that's with, you know, you know we're good at checking 
uh, be blood glucose levels and managing things in the emergent time, but you know how do they get there and how do those medications work? A one three ones and and which doctors have to be involved in being able to network um, things together and how family has to be involved in a diabetic's life to help them um, manage their their um, their disease processes at home. You know you can just go on and on with that. The community paramedic has great opportunities for impact under the existing ALS scope, where other levels may not. So there's things that we can do that have always been able to do without going outside of our scope of practice that we can complement these other agencies that we can work side by side with out in the field. We know to start small and collaborate with other stakeholders and we understand that these concepts can be applied in any county EMS setting. So for those of you that are on the call thinking, well, Dave, you work for a, a hospital and the hospital provides the EMS, so you're just, you're just funded with lots of money. Well, there's, you, it's not true. The county and government EMS agencies out there can do this too. It's all about collaboration and getting together with the hospitals that are in your area and saying, hey, we have this idea. You may have heard about this. How about a little, uh, giving us the opportunity to do something for you out in the field? So go with the brand name that the public health care providers and payers can actually already understand, and that's why we pretty much stuck with community paramedicine under the mobile uh, integrated healthcare umbrella as far as our brand name recognition. Another question for you guys. As of October 2013, there are blank existing known community paramedic mobile integrated healthcare programs in the United States. As of October 2013, take a wild guess at how many existing community paramedic mobile integrated healthcare programs we have up and running as of October. See, most of you are thinking, well, this is challenging probably to put this together, so we're, we're down on the low end there with 82. Two thirty two is making a little comeback there, a little creeping up there. So I've got this this data from the National Association of EMTs who took a poll and uh, gathered all this information for us as far as the reference on this particular question. So we'll move forward here. See, 82 seems to be the leader in 50, 58 percent. It's actually 232. There are 232 existing programs right now that are up and running or partially running in the United States. Now, as we roll into this, I want to talk about how important collaboration and partnerships are and give you some exam examples of where our relationships are with some of the folks the, the folks who are really interested in this community paramedic program here within our own county. Obviously, we have a huge, huge relationship with our hospital, and for those of you out there who are not working with a hospital or you are a hospital, reach out to your EMS agencies and see what they can do. See if you can get this stuff together and work for you in the community. Um, with our hospital, we right now already have um, a vital line, um, which is a nurse triage program up. Our community can call and get uh, you know routine health information from a registered nurse, and if uh, through a through a protocol program on the, on the computer that the registered nurse works with and determine whether or not you actually probably need to go to the emergency room. Um, we have case managers, we have social workers, we have home care, we have our own behavior health. Um, we have a transitionist and a telehealth uh, unit that has been birthed out of the, the Affordable Care Act. We have a couple of fantastic um, RNs who are working with our high um, high risk discharge folks, um, primarily congestive heart failure off of one of our units and their main mission is to call and check in with them and make sure that they have everything that they need on a routine basis and um, if they can't get uh, together with their patient via the telephone or maybe it was the wrong information, um, they're going to be calling the community paramedics to go out and do a visit. So they will be able to have an extension of an actual set of eyes out into their homes as a backup for this program. And of course, your emergency department leadership, you need them on board, absolutely. Um, and you are going to find that they will welcome this with open arms. Readmission reduction strategies, um, you, you'll be able to weigh in on this and decrease the ED bed hours for your familiar faces and then help manage the population overall. Your health man, um, your, your hospitals are going to be your leaders in the community for better health care, uh, along with the government agencies that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, work with your 
ACOs, um, right in, in our area we have Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Um, you know, your proactive services are going to be just as good as your preventative care services. Um, you get these patients to feel better and they're going to, they're going to, their surveys are going to be better, their quality of life is going to be better, people are going to live longer and they're going to be happier. Um, you provide the tools and materials and outreach to help these patients manage their their chronic diseases better be involved and help explain everything, and they have to have a say in it. We understand that. And community paramedics are, are really good at having good, crucial listening conversations because, you know, they've already discovered, too, that if you listen to your patients and then have a discussion with them afterwards, you can really pick on, up on things like they didn't understand stuff in the first place. Help these patients navigate care at the right level, at the right time, in the right setting. So a community paramedic can probably come in and say, I'm really familiar with this patient and uh, give a good enough report to the primary care physician that maybe the, this patient does have to be admitted, but maybe not the high-end coronary care unit. Maybe they can handle just a, just a regular med search floor for whatever they're going through. Sometimes information will fall through the cracks, and the community paramedic can help the other agencies make sure that that information is there at the right time at the right place. Uh, safer, more effective care as a result of shared knowledge, absolutely that's going to happen. Less errors and better care. And overall, if we do all this right, we know we're going to improve the quality and cost of health care. This is a win-win. <clears throat> In our town here, we have a wonderful population of veterans. Um, we have um, we are host to a wonderful brand new facility there, and that's a picture of our Wilmington Outpatient Clinic, our Veterans Administration building here. Um, they uh, actually provide care for a population of roughly 10,000. You'll see that number on the bottom within our region here of seven counties, but they are primarily housed um, here in this area, in New Hanover County, Pender, and Brunswick. Um, that number is expected to start climbing by 5,000 to make it 15,000 here within the next couple of years. Um, we approached them, and we had, uh, we had a handful of meetings with the chief executive medical officer, and uh, he was open-armed with uh, the fact that we would able to be able to provide a service that could complement the existing services for our veterans in our community. And again, these patients are the same patients. They're the diabetic patients. They're the congestive heart failure patients. They're the behavior health patients. Um, this is something that we can bridge and we can work with. And currently, right now, we are trying to get some things moved up the, the ladder of administration to get things approved to see if we could get reimbursed from the government. And right now, we've had smiles and nods so far. So we're we're currently working with our VA program here in town. We'll move on here. And of course, you need the local government. And we, we definitely have the interest and support of our local government agencies because you know, the Department of Health um, is huge. You know, this is where all your data and your numbers are going to come from, where you can see that you need to affect change. Um, the, final, the final presentation that we had to complete um, through the, uh, the training and schooling through Hennepin consisted of uh, a community assessment. So we had to, from scratch, prepare a community assessment here in our own county. And we were surprised at the things that we uncovered, but then again, not so surprised because, you know, we've all been in, in this county and in the homes and in the agencies, and we've seen, seen some of this stuff. So we go to them and we show uh, we show that we've done things like this, and they are they are big big smiles and open arms, saying yes, we can use you to help with. You know, we have a thing called hurricanes that'll come through here, and uh, you know we have an indigent population and a homeless population that doesn't necessarily have the resources that the rest of the population has to to get safe and get uh, get help. A well, community paramedic is going to be able to go around and check on them in the time of storms and in the time of not storms, and be able to work with the health department directly, um, especially care resources for seniors and children. Um, we already are familiar with dealing with this in the homes, and now we can help be a proactive uh, entity with the health department rather than when an EMS personnel typically finds them when something's already happened as far as neglect goes. And we're a resource for immunizations and well checks uh, along with that disaster preparedness. And I believe this is probably going to be our last one. Um, this is an easy one here. True, false, um, those of you out there. Um, tell me what you think about patients in hospice programs. Do they risk being disqualified from eligibility if they are admitted into a hospital? So this, this, is, a, this is a key one here. Do you think they're going to be disqualified from their program if they are admitted into a hospital? I'll give you a few minutes on this.
I see we're leaning towards true. They'll be disqualified from their hospice benefit. And uh, it's pretty close, though, 54 to 40, 52 to 48. Maybe the tone of my voice is changing some opinions here. Again, I am the presenter. Don't trust the presenter. All right, we'll move forward on this. And our final final answer was say 52% uh, of you out there say that it's true. They're going to be removed from that benefit, and 48% say no. It's actually no. Not all programs will disqualify you from the hospice benefit. There is not a rule or regulation set anywhere that says if you go and you get admitted or you go to the emergency room that you're automatically disqualified. Um, these programs vary, and it all depends upon the rules and regulations that they have up have set up individually. And that brings me to the relationship that we've established with our hospice of the Lower Cape Fear. Um, they too do have a congestive heart failure population and uh, this specific program in our community they will not remove you from the benefit if you if you end up having to go to the emergency room or admitted into the hospital. Um, they also have case managers which help navigate patients into hospice services sooner and guess who would also probably be good in the home or wherever they're at and recognize that this is a benefit benefit that somebody probably could use to, to help them out with their conditions. It's something that we envision the community paramedic to be able to do. Again, networking. Um, working with hospice patients specifically, uh, we also can help fill the home visit gaps. Now, the first beta patient that I referenced in the initial, that congestive heart failure patient that I was seeing, he was actually a hospice patient that worked with this specific hospice program. I established a fantastic relationship with, uh, with his lead nurse and uh, all of the support uh, folks that were coming in and out of his home and uh, basically we stayed in contact via telephone and uh, you know we take notes and um, the hospice folks would chart down what I, what I would notice or what I would say and uh, two to three visits a week is what I was filling the gaps on and um, we had fantastic results. Um, our community paramedics received some specialized training in here. They did about 40 hours. Um, they work with their case managers. They work with their care providers. They work with their spiritual care providers. And uh, they rounded with the medical director on both an, both an inpatient and an outpatient environment. Um, and they discovered the importance. Again, continuing on, you'll see behavioral health is pretty much on every single one of these. And behavior is such an important thing when it comes to health care and the overall well-being of your patient. In our community, you know, specifically the, the behavioral services community, again, has been has been looking for somebody to help. And uh, as we look and we read in the paper every day, it seems like there is a need more and more for everything uh, in this country that could benefit from better behavioral services. Um, there is a dire need for support. And uh, in our community right now, there are several coalitions being formed. And we sit on one of those coalitions right now that brings together about I want to say about 11 or 12 different uh, behavioral services providers just from uh, within our county, our own community here. And we're finding that uh, already the community paramedics have an important uh, piece at that table, and uh, they're looking forward to future things that we can do with them in the home as well as in the behavioral departments themselves. And uh, the growing trend right now is looking at uh, doing an injection of medication for the behavior patients should they require that type of medicine rather than an oral medication. So that's something probably that the community paramedic will be able to do uh, with our existing scope of practice down the road. Um, that would be in reference to that monthly injections mark that you see on the on the slide there. And eventually, we could make referrals to these services. Again, this is something that EMS is already pretty familiar with in the home, thinking, well, they probably do need better resources. Maybe some medication will help them have better quality of life. And then guess what? They're not going to be called 911, and they're not going to be heading to the emergency room as often. This is another key piece of the clinical uh, time that our community paramedics have done, about 40 hours in the behavioral services community with with, um, the specialist includes psychiatrists, support services, inpatient, outpatient, really learning how these things work. Our senior care population, you can't, you, you definitely cannot turn your back on these folks. These are, these are key players in your community. You want them at home, and you want them living better, and you want them living longer, and you want them uh, independent, because that, that's sure the way that they would want it. Um, they support our independent living. 
um, through home in home care. So are there days where home health care can't make it? Absolutely, that happens. And this is something that a community paramedic can definitely help fill the gaps on. This is another aspect that, that we've done some uh, clinical training with, our home health care specifically to senior care, as well as some geriatric medicine time with our local physicians here in town. Um, how, you know, providing preventative screening services to include field labs and fall clearances. So this is another thing that uh, I know that Wake County is working on here in North Carolina on um, fall, fall clearances specifically. So you have um, a lot of facilities that will have policies. Well, no matter what, the uh, resident has to go off and be evaluated by a physician in the emergency room, even though um, they're completely fine and they're completely good. Uh, we don't have some of the resources that we need, especially somebody that's already taken, let's say they're taking Coumadin or a blood thinner. So envision uh, a program and a policy set up through medical direction and a procedure that's in place to where the community paramedic is able to come out in a non-emergent after the patient is completely screened and no deficits whatsoever. Um, then we're able to come out and check an INR, check a, check a blood level. Um, within a few minutes we have a result and then we would get online with a, a med control and explain everything to them and maybe we we can, we can have them sign off there and stop them from having to go to the emergency room, which is going to just involve a quick turnaround and uh, the ambulance heading right back to that facility. This is something that we envision we will probably be able to do in the future. And I'll speak a little bit more to that right here. Uh, the relationship that you can have with your primary care physicians. Now, I read a really interesting paper out of California a few months ago where basically the doom and gloom was beware primary care physicians because these community paramedics are out to take all the business away from emergency rooms. So in the end, you know, uh, I think that we will uh, establish better care and better relations and we will give these primary care physicians an opportunity to reach more of their patients in their homes. Um, whether it be through supporting home health care services that they have up, maybe it's going to be uh, a patient that did not make their appointment, maybe something was wrong, maybe the community paramedic gets dispatched to go and check on them and make sure everything is okay and uh, call into that primary care physician's office and say, hey, you know, um, they just forgot their appointment and get it to reschedule. There's so many patients that the primary care physicians out there have to see now, it is possible that a few of them can kind of slip you know, into the cracks as much as we don't want them to, but this is a safety catch, especially for our elderly population. Um, we explain to the primary care physicians out there that our skills and procedures that we can already do can help us, help you keep the, your patients out of the emergency room and just come into your office routinely for regular things. And again, you'll see this medical screenings reference that I have on here as far as the lab services go and iStat testing. This is where we have a, we've established a fantastic relationship with our lab department in our hospital because uh, for those of you who are familiar out there, there are rules and regulations to testing and it's a good thing. It really is because we want these tests to be 100% reliable and 100% correct all the time for every single patient that we do a test on. And um, we have um, an established relationship that says, yes, we are going to probably go ahead and give you 100% approval on a, a COAG machine to where we can do PTs and INRs out in the field. Um, Specifically here in uh, North Carolina, this is something that we can do as long as we have a procedure written down for us. So just envision this, you know, the patient that is on blood thinners doesn't necessarily have to go to the the Coumadin clinic or you know, wherever testing site once or twice a month. Um, they continue to they can continue to go on the golf course and enjoy themselves because maybe the community paramedic can can swing by and do that testing for them in the field, um, in their homes. This is something that we anticipate our primary care physicians to pretty uh, be pretty interested in um, because their patients are going to be happier because this is less less. Uh, less time they have to spend going off and getting tests done and more time um, enjoying their lives. Medication reconciliation, so uh, you know these patients wind up with so many of the community paramedics are um, trained in how to keep track of these medications, how to network and how to get on the phone when they recognize that something is not uh, correct with too many medications, not enough medications, and then helping the patient understand why they're taking these medications. Another gem for the primary care physician's patient population out there. And then procedure discharge 
follow-ups. How many patients just want to get out of the hospital because they're happy that they've received this fantastic care and they're healed and they're ready to go home and they hear about half of the instructions that are made. Well, just imagine whether or not it be an orthopedic patient or somebody who's just being discharged from the hospital. Imagine um, what it would be like to have a community paramedic go in and visit that patient one to two days later just to make sure they understood how to manage their pain. They've filled their prescriptions. They've got all this stuff going. Um, you can imagine the success, and again, you're going to keep patients out of the hospital. You're going to keep uh, physicians and on-call physicians from having to get those annoying phone calls in the middle of the night saying, I'm not managing my pain because I didn't fill my prescription. A community paramedic can help support um, that aspect and make sure that they get what they need. And again, better care, they're staying at home, and they're happier. And uh, one of the last slides here, of course, you, you, you have to address this population because this is where a lot of patients will sit in your nonprofits and then again your familiar pace, uh, places. And you see I, I have a couple of references here, St. Mary's Titleson Social Outreach, um, the Salvation Army. Um, we have uh, a few shelters in our, in our area. Just imagine a mobile clinic um, with a community paramedic and a physician, whether it be our medical director or maybe one of the hospital uh, residents heading out and doing some preventative work, checking some blood pressures, making sure our populations here, um, whether they be homeless or just uh, down on their luck, have the medications that they need before the 911 call has to be made, before they're in distress. You know, we realize that if we're going to fix this, if we're going to have positive impact in the community, we have to go find them. We have to help them and we have to lead them to medicine and lead them to better health care at their doorstep. We uh, distribute street sheets of information. Uh, a lot of times people just don't know the phone numbers to call and uh, you would think it's so simple just to pop it into your phone in Google. Well, not everybody has that resource, so we give them the street sheets that are loaded with information to the services and we completely distribute them, again, hopefully getting them the services they need before they have to make the 911 call. Um, tracking the homeless and transient patient populations, we're by the beach, so this is where a lot of transient folks want to come through and hang out for a bit. Um, and as you can imagine, those folks probably will be out of their um, their inhalers if they have um, the asthma or COPD. They'll be out of um, you know all the medications that they need because let's say they never got the prescription filled at the last time they were in. So again, we catch them in the shelters in these areas and we get them before and say, hey, you, you know, I noticed that you that you have this inhaler do you, and you're out of it. Can we get you, you know, tracked with our social service or linked up with our social services here in town to get you the meds that you need? And again, preventing them from being in distress three or four days later and having to call 911. And then meet with our religious uh, leaders in our community. We have, and they're welcoming, welcoming us with uh, open arms, too. Um, the food donation places, you know, they do a good job of um, handing out food, but not every single one of them understands that uh, some of the homeless population or the folks they're helping out that have congestive heart failure or diabetes need a specific required uh, diet. You know, salt, salt runs freely in uh, the cheapest food out there. And that's another thing that our community paramedics uh, learn through our diet nutrition courses, that um, managing the diet and uh, nutrition of these folks is crucial. And that can also lead to them not having to call 911 in the moment of distress, just with uh, managing their diets. We definitely have um, a great working relationship right now with the existing programs that we have here in North Carolina Community Paramedic-wise. Um, again, like I said, we get together um, once a month via telephone, or, and uh, we, uh, the State Office of the EMS has brought us together up in our capital a couple of times um, to share what we have going on with our entire state. Um, we're proud of the leadership that uh, the Office of EMS has given us through this. Um, but we realize that everything has to be standardized and that data is important. Um, that third one down there, that EMS pick, our Performance Improvement Center, um, they are an organization that collects and manages data that means something to everybody out there. And these guys are fantastic. They've been, uh, they work in both North Carolina and South Carolina. And we do have a, a, a program, Abbeville, South Carolina, who also received a grant from Duke at the same time that we did. So we're, we're actually, North Carolina is reaching down to South Carolina, and we're working together with um, Abbeville, South Carolina, to share what's going to work best with all of our programs. So it's not just 
about North Carolina, it's about South Carolina, it's about the whole country. Um, we're coming together, uh, trying to come up with rules because, you know, some stuff has to be regulated out there. And we're looking at, you know, curriculum recommendations. You know, we favor this, um, we favor a little more experience for the community paramedic in all these specialty areas. Um, but is, is, is the Minnesota platform going to be the best? Um, or, or other similar platforms out there. You know, our, our belief right now is that it, it was a great program and we stand by it. Um, developing sustainable funding sources. Again, the offices of Medicare and Medicaid, will they recognize this as a billable thing for our folks uh, for the community paramedic visit? Um, the private entities out there, will they be willing to uh, make, uh, you know, uh, make donations <laughs> or, uh, bill, uh, or pay, pay the bills, you know, on a small bill. And we can show that, you know, X amount of investment into us is going to save hundreds of thousands in the end. Right now the answer is yes. It's just establishing those pathways and getting stuff down and getting contracts written and working with um, our business folks inside the hospital. Again, um, the conclusion, the conclusion of our our program here today, our lecture, and on this final slide, I just want to point out these key things here, and this is, you know, the collaboration of that puzzle piece up there, and then the bridge building between the hospital and the home, and, you know, I pause on that, and I think, you know, community paramedic was always thought of as a rule provider type thing, you know, and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, the, the necessity to have a somebody like a community paramedic head out to the rural areas because they can't reach uh, the hospital and their primary care providers. So my stance is basically if if somebody lives one block away from the hospital and they don't know how to network and they don't know how to reach that hospital or health care, then they might as well be a thousand miles away. So I think the days of thinking that community health care is only going to have the benefit of rule versus metro are over, especially uh, when access seems to be one of the biggest problems that we have. We want to keep everybody out of the hospital unless they need to be there and we want to have measurable patient satisfaction and key points that are going to that are going to show that this pays the bill and this is worth it. Again, anybody has any questions that they don't want to ask through today, feel free to email either my chief director there or myself. So those are the two email addresses. Um, we've received so much help from other programs across the country, and it's been conditional that we will turn around and share as much as we can with everybody else, and we absolutely are committed to that. So with that, I'll hand it back over to the moderator and uh, welcome any of the questions that you have. Thanks very much, David. Um, we are uh, just about up against time constraints, so we only have time for about one or two questions now. However, if anyone wants to, to send questions to David, uh, as uh, he indicated, he's willing to accept them directly, or we will uh, forward any questions you submitted through uh, the webinar uh, directly to David as well. So we will start with um, uh, one question uh, from an attendee. Uh, David, Somebody wants to know about um, integrating uh, electronic health record systems in ambulances with hospital systems and home health. Uh, will, will hospital staff and home health staff be able to view your documentation? Sure. So this is a this is a really good question. Uh, now, as soon as we have our Epic modules built in, then like I uh, I referenced, we'll be able to uh, log into Epic, and the community paramedics will be able to. Um, you know, chart as freely as anybody else uh, would be able to. But in the meantime, right now, our home health care that um, works with our hospital and the other other departments have access to the, the primary way that we chart, which is through EMS charts, which is an electronic chart. So what we've been doing in the meantime is putting in an electronic chart and then, uh, you know, sending either an email or a telephone call letting them know that we have a chart on the visit in there in existence in the queue and that they have access to that chart and they can view it. Thanks, David. So we will take one more question, um, a question from an attendee about uh, readmissions. Uh, David, the U.S. Uh, hospital readmissions data was just released, uh, and I saw that the New Hanover Medical Center had no readmission penalties for fiscal year 2013-2014. Do you attribute the hospital's success to the community paramedicine program that you and your team run? Sure, good question. So that's overall, we've received no penalties, and we are extremely proud of that. Um, 
and it, whether or not the community paramedic program right now had a direct impact on that, I would say that it was a small impact and that this is something that we're looking at. We want to keep that at zero every year, and uh, the community paramedic program, once it gets up and running full blast, will definitely be a major contributor to keeping that at zero. Thanks very much, David. Before we wrap up, I'd like to ask the audience to take part in an exit survey that will pop up on your screen. Thanks to everyone again for joining us today. And if you'd like to view the archive of the webinar or to share it with a colleague, please visit the on-demand webinar section on healthcareitnews.com or hims.org. Thanks again, everyone, and have a nice day.